Our series in James continues, and this morning we look at the third chapter, starting with the first verse. Let us listen together for God's word to us. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with the bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine, figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, in your presence, we silence our mouths, we open our hearts, that we might hear your voice. So by the power of your spirit, speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. To quote a theologian I read recently, chatter has replaced authentic words. Words no longer have any weight, there is too much talking. True, right? An apt description of the world today. These words were written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer in 1943, nearly 80 years ago. Imagine what Bonhoeffer would think today. I suspect that we can all agree that in the world, in our lives, there is too much chatter. There's too much unnecessary speech. There is too much ugly speech. There is too much harm caused by the tongue. I listened to a news podcast this week that went inside the operations of a, of a polling effort. Uh, they were conducting a poll in five Midwest swing states and in Iowa, since Iowa is an early primary state in the presidential election. And they were asking these callers uh, about their experience. And they shared about how they might make two to three hundred phone calls in a single day and get five to ten actual conversations out of all of those. Some others, just some, some people just hang up. Others respond uh, with incredible and surprising rudeness. So they asked these callers, of these six states that you're canvassing, which one do you get the best response from? Which one gives you, or are you most successful in reaching? And they all said Iowa. Iowa people are, are eager to talk politics. Maybe that's just the nature of a state that is an early primary state. Uh, For the most part, they're willing to answer and have these conversations. The follow-up question was, which is the worst state out of these six states? And unanimously, they said, Michigan. (laughs) Michigan. If they could get somebody on the phone, chances are that person was going to yell at them or curse at them or rudely end the phone call. Michigan. So much for Midwest nice, right? (laughs) How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. These are strong words. I recently discovered a nonprofit organization that's been around for about a decade. It's called the Dangerous Speech 
project. And this organization exists for the sole purpose of helping people identify dangerous speech, both online, in our, in our many online worlds, and in political speech, because they recognize the danger posed by speech in these particular places. But we all know the danger of speech in many places, and not just in politics, and not just in social media. We know that in each of our lives, in our relationships, in our workplaces, we know that speech hurts and it angers. We know that it distorts and it deceives. We know that it dismisses and it belittles. We know that it does all these things because these have been done to us. And we have done these things to others. It's no coincidence that one of the earliest disciplines of monks, as soon as there were such a thing as monks in the Christian church, one of their earliest disciplines was silence. Long periods of silence because they knew how tempting it is to, for speech to lead to sin. Proverbs 10.19 says, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but the prudent are restrained in speech. Now, I should acknowledge an irony here that I am preaching on this passage. James says, not many of you should become teachers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for all of us make many mistakes. So here I am, a teacher, teaching on a passage about why we shouldn't be teaching, speaking, using my tongue, speaking on a, a passage that speaks of the dangers of speaking. In fact, last week, as many of you know, I had almost no voice because I had laryngitis, and had I been smart, I would have flip-flopped our passages and gotten up here today and said the tongue is a, fl- is a, is a fire and we shouldn't use it, and then I could sit right down. It'd be the shortest <laughs> sermon ever point made. The tongue is a fire. No one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. There's too much chatter. But there's a catch too. Because it's clear from this text that James is not just assuming we're going to hear his words and all decide to take a vow of silence. James knows that Christians must speak. If we're going to be in the world and participate in the world and give witness and voice to the good news of God and Jesus Christ, James knows that Christians have to speak. Now, this struck me as a left turn for James. James, who had been talking about faith by itself, if it has no deeds, is dead. You remember that from last week. James' most famous passage, and he goes on and on in some of the words we didn't even read about why faith and and deeds go hand in hand, and then all of a sudden he takes this left turn and we're talking about teaching. And we're talking about the tongue and its power to do uh, evil. It seems like a strange choice for the next point. In fact, many commentators over over the history of the church have said that James really is not a letter to the churches. It's just this hodgepodge of wisdom, this random collection of things all brought together, given the stamp of the name James, and sent out to the churches as a letter. But more recently, commentators have begun to see that there is a through line in the book of James, that there is a cohesive aspect to this book that makes it look less like a a random collection and more like a focused sermon. James is not just switching over to a new subject. James is connecting the two. He's taking this conversation about faith, and deeds, this idea that it's meaningless to say that we trust God if our deeds don't bear evidence of that trust. And then he's connecting it to the tongue. He's presenting speech as the first test case of the relationship of faith and deeds. Or we might even say the most challenging case for all of us of the way that faith and deeds connect. It's the most widespread failure of the connection of faith and deeds deeds. Our speech is a deed. It's an act, a work that ought to reflect our faith. He says, with the tongue, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. And so here he hits the nail on the head. This idea is at the heart of what people perceive as Christian hypocrisy. This is what for so many makes the Christian church unpopular, unattractive. 
Christians, people will say, say one thing and do another. Notice those words that I use. They say one thing and they do another. Christians bless God on Sunday and don't seem to care about their neighbors the rest of the week. This may be true. It may feel true. It may feel offensive to you. But this is the nature of how the Christian church, by and large, is perceived by the outside world. Speech is where the rubber meets the road of the relationship between faith and deeds. And James is not out on a limb all by himself here. Remember the words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds. And give glory to your Father in heaven, saying and doing. Now James starts out talking about the tongue a bit more positively. He talks about it as a a bit that you put in the mouth of a horse to guide the horse. A rudder, a small rudder that can steer a large ship. These are ambivalent analogies. These things can be used for good or for ill. They illustrate the power of the tongue, but it's almost as if James is writing this letter and he's saying these things about the power of the tongue and suddenly things are starting to occur to him as he's writing. He's thinking about the division and the troubles that exist in their own churches then. Starting to think about lives that have been destroyed by the power of the tongue. Starting to think about Michiganders and their rude responses to anonymous telephone calls. Starting to think about the ugly, mean-spirited things that, that pervade social media and the internet today. All of these things that seem suddenly occur to James as he's writing. And he says, you know what? The tongue is a fire. No one can tame the tongue. The problem with speech, with our speaking, with our use of words, is that it comes so easily to us. And so the temptation to do wrong with it is so powerful. Speaking is the most potent and the most fraught of all human actions. There are few things that we do every day that have the power that speech does. The power to do good, the power to do harm. And James is saying to us that saying and doing both reflect or should reflect the faith that we have in God or else we should stop talking. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and brackish water, can a fig tree yield olives or a grapevine figs? Can a person call Jesus Lord and not seek to walk in his footsteps? Can a person claim to be a Christian and ignore the need of the vulnerable? Can a person have faith in God and have no love for God's children? No more can salt water yield fresh. Let us pray. God, we get ourselves into trouble when we speak. We acknowledge the danger of the tongue, the danger of our words and our tendency to use them, not to build up, not to bring life, but to bring harm. And so we pray that our act of speech would reflect the faith that we have in you, the trust that we have placed in you to transform our lives and this world. May the deeds of our words reflect who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.